Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this sad little security camera monitor here, and we're gonna be fixing it up. I featured it on the second channel video where we figured out that while it works and is very feature capable, it has some serious screen burn-in. So today we're gonna to actually fix this thing by swapping the CRT, and maybe if that works well, doing an RGB mod on this thing as well. So without further ado, let's get right to it. What I really like about this trash pick monitor is that the boxy shape of it just makes it really easy to, well, store because I can stack stuff on top of it and the convenient carry handles mean it's really easy to move around. But in addition, we figured out in the second channel video, this thing is a multi-format monitor as well. So full PAL and NTSC support. And as I mentioned in the intro, the jungle chip that's inside of this thing actually has the capability of having an RGB input because, well, originally it was designed for televisions with on-screen displays or probably SCART, and uh, that's not used on this set. So that means specifically that an RGB mod is possible. Now, when it comes to this burned-in CRT on here, I didn't really dive too far into like what the pinout was on the back and how compatible this was going to be with other CRTs taken from another monitor. But judging from the fact this monitor is pretty late model, I'm thinking that this CRT is gonna be fully interchangeable with any other 13 inch monitor or TV that is that you find on the side of the street. And that is exactly what I have to hopefully bring this thing back to life. And you probably are asking, what am I gonna to use to swap into this thing? Well, the CRT from this very sad little television, which interestingly looks or is exactly the same as the TV that I swapped that Chinese modern CRT guts into. This sad little television was a rescue and, uh, well, look at it. I probably spent some time outside. It's really dirty. It's missing its power cord. Someone obviously cut that off. And looking at the CRT, I don't see any burn-in, which is a good thing, but there is a bunch of paint on here. First things first, I'm gonna move this thing off the bench and let's open up the dirty TV. Now, even though it's in rough condition, I don't wanna risk scratching the picture tube. So I'm gonna lay it on its face like this, but on that cloth. And I've donned some gloves because uh, inevitably this thing is gonna be gross inside. There is evidence of uh, grossness. And there's the power cord that someone snipped to, uh, I guess, get the copper or whatever. I don't know the specifics on this monitor, like where it was found. A friend of mine had it and gave it to me for this express purpose. So because the cord is cut, I have no idea how well this thing works, if it works at all, but it doesn't really matter because, uh, well, we're taking the CRT and the rest of it will be recycled. Now, if you do find one of these Philips Magnavox sets floating around on the street, it is a decent little TV. It's got composite input on the front only, by the way. Back only has RF. But unlike the security camera monitor that we're gonna be putting the CRT into, this thing does not support PAL. Interestingly, it actually sort of supports PAL. If you give it a 50 hertz signal, it actually shows the picture properly, but there's no color decoding at all. And it's really kind of lame because I looked up the, the chip that's in here, it's a Philips chip. And unfortunately it has the capability of showing PAL, but Philips like saved like 30 cents by not installing a few components that prevent it from actually decoding the color properly. In addition, if you have one of these and you're thinking about RGB modding it, it's not possible because this is quite a late model set where the on-screen displays are generated right inside the equivalent of what the jungle IC is. The microcontroller, the jungle IC, on-screen displays, everything is integrated into one single chip. And that just means there's no external RGB inputs on it that allow you to, well, do anything with it. And there's one final screw here, which is going into the flyback. And I think we should be good to go for lifting this off. There we go. Wow, well, kind of as I suspected, this thing inside looks, I mean, it's not like zero hour, but it's low hour. There's just not a lot of evidence of use on this because there's not a lot of soot and stuff in here. Now, please remember, do not work inside CRTs if you don't know what you're doing. There's dangerous things in here, especially mains voltage if you have it powered up and plugged in. Not to mention, of course, the CRT is in a vacuum and that is a risk as well if you break it or something like that while working on it. So this video is purely for entertainment purposes only. So do not work inside of these things unless you absolutely positively know how to do so safely. So next step, pull all the guts out of this thing and remove the CRT from this cheap plastic case. 
This particular set seems to use bolts here to hold the CRT in, so I've got to use my uh, ratchet here to get these out. All right, so the bolts are out, so this chassis is loose, and we're going to pull off this ground lead right here. And then what we have here, this blue wire has to do with the degaussing coil that's right here. So we got to unplug that from the main board here. There we go. And with the neck board high voltage anode held out of the way, the last thing we're going to have to disconnect is the deflection yoke there. So this just comes off the board like so. And now the CRT should be free to come out. So lift it from the tabs. Do not lift it from this part here. And this should be free. There we go. Whoa, oh dear, that almost fell on the floor. <laughs> okay, so looking at this CRT here, we can probably take off this degaussing coil because I have a feeling the other set has one and we'll just reuse that one. So this is taped on with really sticky, gross tape. And the way this works is when you first plug in these types of cheap sets, what it does is it energizes this, whoops, at mains voltage, so directly connected to the AC line which gives you 60 Hertz in North America here of an alternating magnetic field that goes back and forth, back and forth. And then what happens is there's like a varistor or a thermistor that's on the board that as it warms up, the current that's going to the coil gets less and less and less. So that alternating field gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it's completely gone. And that has the effect of canceling out any stored magnetic fields that might exist in the front of the set that can cause color distortion. So that's what this is. And you pretty much need that for a color set. Otherwise you're gonna be left with some color distortion. Ugh, this tape is sticky. When you move the set around because you're turning it against the magnetic field of the earth and you also need to cancel that out. So that, that degaussing coil is helping with that stuff. Now this stretched wire that goes across the CRT on this matte surface and this black wire here, this is the ground of the capacitor. Because remember, this thing is a big capacitor. This is one of the leads right here that goes to the inside. And then this is on the outside. The glass is like the dielectric insulator. And you need the ground here connected to the electronics so that this can generate high voltage properly. And this matte surface here, it's actually like a conductive paint that goes all the way around the CRT here. But see, it's not right here where that's just glass. And it's not right here because obviously if it's too close to there, you can actually get an arc between the ground and the high voltage anode connection. And I think that's where you might get arcing occasionally is if you have some built up soot or whatever that might be slightly conductive here, you can actually get some arcing under the cap. So that's why occasionally cleaning this area with the CRT off, of course, and fully discharged can solve some of your arcing issues. Now, when it comes to compatibility of tube swaps, there's a couple things you have to keep in mind. The implosion band, which is this metal band around the set here, has these mounting tabs on it. And CRTs can mount in various different ways. Sometimes it uses tabs. Sometimes there's like a strap that goes around the CRT and holds it in. Well, if it's a set that's using tabs like this one, the other picture tube needs to have the same kind of tabs because occasionally they're mounted on the front of the implosion band. You can see on this one, they're mounted towards the back or towards the neck here. We tried to put this CRT into a set that needs the tabs on the front. Well, obviously there's gonna be a spacing issue and actually won't fit. If it's the other way around, you'll end up with like a big gap in the front of the set and uh, that doesn't work either. Now, if that security camera monitor needs a CRT with the tabs mounted towards the front here, not all is lost with this CRT in that monitor because we could use a spacer and longer bolts and theoretically get that mounted. Looking at this whole assembly right here, we have the deflection yoke right here. So this has horizontal and vertical deflection, which connects to these wires here. Incidentally, this monitor does not have a little cover over this, but the horizontal deflection is actually relatively high voltage on color CRTs. So you really, really need to avoid touching this area while the set is running because you could get a nasty zap. Anyhow, this deflection yoke on here has been set up by someone at the factory, a technician, and there's little spacers and things in here just to get it aligned correctly because moving this around has a big effect on the geometry of what you're seeing on the front of the CRT. Also, the convergence can be affected as well. So ideally, if you're doing a tube swap, you don't wanna to touch this if it's possible. The problem is some other sets require different impedance and things on the deflection yoke and you cannot just reuse the one from the old monitor, the one you're taking the tube out of. You have to take it off and use the one from the monitor that the CRT is going into. That's to ensure compatibility. In addition, this assembly up here is the convergence assembly and this has been adjusted by a technician as well. Well, the problem is to get the yoke off, we have to take that off and then putting it all back together in a way that presents a good image 
Well, it can be a little bit tricky, especially for someone who's a novice and hasn't done that before. Ideally, if I've done tube swaps in the past, I found that I had to swap the deflection yoke, but for the convergence assembly, I had to take it off and I had to mark where it was exactly, take it off and put it exactly back in the same position, but using the deflection yoke from the monitor that the CRT is going into, and I was able to get it working, but I still had to get this thing positioned exactly right with these little spacers and stuff like that, because every deflection yoke is slightly different. Remember, it's wound coils and things like that. So the shape of it and the position and stuff is gonna vary from one monitor to another. And then the final thing to worry about for compatibility is the connector on the back of the CRT here. You have to make sure that this is the same from the donor monitor or the donor CRT like this one into the you know destination monitor that we're trying to fix. I'm pretty sure, oh, I'm 99.9% .9 positive this is gonna be the same as the monitor this is going into, but I can tell you for sure that this CRT will not work in something like a Commodore 1084. That's a higher resolution CRT and it has a different connector on the back here. It is not compatible. But I found that like 13 inch TV style monitors, low resolution things generally are all intercompatible. In fact, I know for sure that the monitor or this CRT out of that Magnavox monitor works for instance perfectly in a Commodore 1702 monitor. It's fully compatible, at least with the connector here. I'm not sure about the tabs and the other things, but electrically you can plug it in here and it does work. All right, so let's see how this thing looks on the front. Super duper filthy, but I'm gonna give this thing a clean. First of all, I wanna see if there's any scratches in here because I really don't wanna put a CRT in the other monitor that's got scratches. That's, that's gonna really bug me. All right, so good old Windex to the rescue here. Let's get this off and let's also try to get this paint off of here. Ooh, I don't know. There might be a scratch or two. Oh no, that just, that paint came right off. What, how did this paint even get on here? Wow, just using my thumb with these rubber gloves seems to be cleaning it all off. But I just wanna make sure we don't have any scratches in the glass. Glass is a pretty hard material and it's not easy to scratch, but what can scratch it is concrete. If you lay the TV or whatever face down because of the bulbous surface and the curved surface on here, the bulbous surface can result in the middle part of the screen here touching the concrete, which will, well, very easily scratch the glass. And that is not something you can just take care of very easily. There might be ways to polish it or something like that to, to get that off, but that type of glass expertise is something that I don't have <laughs> and I've tried using like, you know, various types of polishes and abrasives and things, and nothing has ever really resulted in an improvement. What I can say though, is that this looks amazing. Yes, now that the paint's gone and all the filth that was on here, this little CRT is looking super awesome. What I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna clean the back of the CRT here, especially around the uh, anode connection here, just to make sure that we have a nice clean back of the set. And there's a little bit of soot on here, you know, that came from use and stuff, but overall it's actually pretty good. I'm gonna say that this thing is relatively low hour. We don't need the Magnavox sticker anymore because of course this is not going into another Magnavox. Make sure when you clean it, you don't use anything abrasive because you don't want to take off this DAG coating, this paint that's on you, that matte paint, remember, has to be there. It's part of what makes the CRT work. So don't take this off. Next up, I'm gonna take the outer cover of the security camera monitor completely off. Something I didn't do in that second channel video, I only had the back cover off. We need to take the, obviously the, the entire surround off as well <laughs> to get the CRT in and out without too much difficulty. One negative about the security camera monitor here is it doesn't have any geometry controls on the outside of the monitor. So there's no easy way to adjust that stuff without having to take the whole cover off. I kind of wish it had some more controls on the back here just so I could adjust that. But that's not gonna be the end of the world. And it's gonna be really nice to have a good working multi-format monitor in a very portable and easy to move around case like this. Back cover removed. Yeah, ah, great. Okay, I know you can't see this, but I can see that the mounting tabs that are on the CRT in here are the same as those. So there shouldn't be any problem. And definitely this connector is the same as well. Looks like to get the outer cover off, there are six screws on the bottom and then there's some that are around the front bezel. Okay, I think all the screws are out. Whoa. Okay, I think I took too many screws out. <laughs> the whole thing is very floppy now. <laughs> Top tip when you take this thing apart, if you have one of these, don't take this screw out or the one on the other side that's in the front bezel plus the two on the bottom because that's what holds the whole CRT in. And now it's, uh, yeah, it's floppy. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to get this thing all back together again. Hmm. And to make matters worse, I left one of the screws on on the bottom 
So the top cover doesn't come off and now the whole CRT is loose. <laughs> so let me try to solve the problem that I just created with this shenanigans. So there it is. That's the inside of the security camera monitor. It's quite serviceable, lots of space and stuff in here and it's nice and solid even when it's uh, with the cover off like this. So as a reminder, to get that top cover off, there are screws on the bottom. There are two on this side, two on the other side, and then there's this screw, this screw, this screw, and another one like this on the other side, and then that top cover comes off. You don't take off this screw here, the two that are on the bottom around the surround, or the one on the other side, because that's what attaches the CRT to the rest of this. So taking a look at the CRT part number here, we have a 34 ag II3X22. And on the one that we took out of the TV, we have A34AGII3X95. So the part number is almost identical except for the last two digits. I don't know what that means exactly, but there we go. I can see here that the connector for the deflection yoke is different. We have two separate connections, one for horizontal and one for vertical. And on the security camera monitor, I can see that it goes down to the board there with just a single connection. So to even attempt to use that deflection yoke on this, we're just gonna have to chop this connector off here and solder the wires together. And that may work, but it may not. I'll do a few tests with the LCR meter to measure the inductance of the coils here, just to see if they're even remotely compatible. All right, so just like for the TV, I need to extricate this CRT from the monitor so I can have them both on the bench and we can compare any differences that might exist. Unplug the ground wire here from the DAG ground. This wire right here is the degaussing coil, so we're gonna unplug that. And I haven't used this thing in ages, so there's not gonna be any high voltage in here. But if you are going to be working on one of these and you're gonna disconnect the high voltage, you need to discharge it first because this is obviously a big capacitor and it can store a bit of a wallop. In fact, here's a top tip. If you turn off your TV or your monitor, once it's completely off and you keep hearing a ch -ch 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 -ch, kind of a static sound, that is the high voltage draining from the CRT. If you don't hear that, there's a good chance there's no dropper resistor and the charge is just held in the CRT and will very slowly discharge over time. For discharging CRTs, I use a high voltage probe. So you connect the lead that comes out of the probe onto the ear right here, which connects it to the ground of the set. And then you get that underneath the high voltage cap and you'll see the high voltage on there and then it will slowly go down as it discharges. And you'll actually hear that static discharge that I'm talking about that some sets do because they have that dropper resistor. The nice thing about these as well is you can actually see the high voltage draining down to zero so you know it's safe and it doesn't discharge the CRT as a full short circuit like you would if you put a screwdriver in there with a clip lead which creates a loud snap. This actually gently discharges over the course of like, I don't know, three or four seconds. So that's why I prefer to use these. All right, let's get this dead CRT out of here. And to do that, of course, it's easier if you just put it face down. This uses screws instead of bolts like on the uh, television there. It's the same thing. We just have to lift this out. And actually I have to be careful because, oh, okay, it's okay. Sometimes the weight of this might tilt the whole thing back. Uh, well, here's something funny. I just noticed that this black wire here is cut and there's the other end of it. It's gonna be hard to see. I bet you I did that. This was, I think, zip tied and I must've cut the zip tie and I obviously cut into this and that would have been in the second channel video. Interesting is that I don't remember any faults uh, appearing in this set, everything worked fine. So I need to remember to reconnect that before I put this thing back together. Obviously with the CRT out now, this is a good chance if you wanna like, I don't know, observe, make sure everything is good with the uh, boards here and the front controls. I'm probably gonna take this little board off here, there's two screws, get some deoxid in those controls just to make sure this thing works as good as possible. All right, so here it is, the very sad, and worn out set out of the security camera monitor. We can actually see a little bit more of the writing that was off the top through the bezel. <laughs> it's really, really not looking good, this poor old CRT. But take a look at this. There are the two CRTs right next to each other and yep, no problems. These mounting tabs are in exactly the same position. Everything is looking completely compatible. There is just so much soot on this one that's really worn out versus the one that came out of the TV. Just a quick interruption while editing. Notice the area of the CRT between the sticker and the deflection yoke. There's the section of the glass that's light gray on the newer CRT, the less worn out one, but on the other one, it's really dark and brown. Now, the funny thing is I thought that was just soot here in the video, and that's why I mentioned soot, but I actually went and tried to clean that after the fact, and it didn't come off. That's on the inside of the CRT. So my assumption is whatever emissions are coming from the neck are actually burning off and ending up on the inside of the entire CRT, which probably has the effect of dulling the image that displays on the phosphor because that coating is all over the front of the set too. 
And there are some additional little strips here to correct like corner distortion and stuff like that on the old worn out CRT. So maybe the technicians did a little bit extra work on that when they got the geometry and everything correct. And I don't see that happening on this one. Oh, I stand corrected actually. There's one of the strips right there. These strips have a little piece of metal on them and it's a special kind of material that blocks the magnetic field. And when you stick it under there, it fixes specific little problem areas on the CRT. Now these little corrective actions are taken because every CRT is slightly different. Every deflection yoke is slightly different. And when you put them together, you do have to take corrective action just to get the picture looking decent. Now, a cheap TV like this, I mean, they're going to put like 30 seconds of corrective action. You're going to look at it. This is in the factory, right? The technician is going to look at it, going to adjust things. They're going to put some glue. They're going to stick some strips in there. And like, okay, good. Next. Barely any work goes into it. But obviously, the higher price the monitor, the more corrective action goes into it. And looking at this one, there's a strip here. I see one on the back side. Okay, I just see two. So this has one, but that might've been all it needed. You know, sometimes you might have none actually. Either way, you have to remember that those technicians who are putting these things together in the factory are very skilled at adjusting and setting these things up and can do it very quickly. Someone like me who's done this before is such a novice that getting this all right is, well, really, really not easy. All right, first thing I wanna do is do some CRT testing. I'm not gonna do any rejuvenation. I just wanna see how strong the new CRT is versus the old one. We're gonna check the emissions here. This is a Koenig Electric TR850. I think it's an 850. Yes, 850. This is sold in the US as the B and K 960 maybe. I forgot the exact uh, model number, but there's a US version that's exactly the same. And it's pretty much one of the last CRT testers that was ever made. I think it's from the 90s or so. And then, you know, obviously, well, there was no more need for these any longer. It has rejuvenation capabilities and stuff, but I will not be using that. We're just gonna be checking the emissions. So let me get this thing set up and let's see how the old CRT looks first. All right, the tester is connected up and you can see my messy harness here. And that's because when I got this CRT tester, I only had a few of these sockets. I didn't have the right ones for, you know, various CRTs that I need to use all the time. So I took one of these that I probably would never use. I don't know, A4, whatever that is. And then I built this harness essentially. And then I, I don't know, I salvaged this connector off an old dead CRT. And that allows me to connect up to this particular CRT with this tester. We have the RGB connected plus the grids and stuff like that. We'll just leave this right here. And then before powering this thing on, we have to make sure we set it for 6.3 volts for the heater voltage, because that is what all these color CRTs are. So I have the cutoff set. I have the color tracking set. I have to turn the cutoff all the way up so this CRT has really bad cutoff. And there are the emissions. As we knew, because we actually tried this CRT, that is, well, really, really sad. I'm just gonna write down these values, and then we can compare to what we get on the donor CRT. There's one other test we can do while it's on a mission test is we can push this life test button on the bottom here, which I think lowers the voltage to the heater. And you should see how quickly or how slowly these drop. I'm holding the button. They're actually dropping very, very little. So that's interesting. I don't know what that means exactly. I've seen other worn out CRTs where whatever emissions they had, when I held the button, the needle very quickly dropped. But here it's just sitting here happily with slightly reduced emissions. When we let go, it should come back. Anyhow, I wrote down the numbers, so let's swap to the other one and see what we're getting there. I've found that with CRTs that haven't been used in a long time, they actually get a little bit of life back if you just leave them with the heater running. So I have it on G1 variable with the G1 set to minus 100 volts. So we're not putting any current through the cathodes right now, which actually isn't good for them to drive them at full current, which is what this does when you push emission test. So I'm just gonna leave this here for like 10 minutes here, and then we'll measure what the emissions are on the new donor CRT. All right, it baked for a little longer than, you know, 10 minutes because I went up and had lunch. So hopefully it hasn't damaged anything. Let's see what we get on emissions test. We are at around 0.7 on all three of them. The green is just slightly lower. And this is what I was getting on the other CRT, 0 0.45, 0 0.5, 0 0.48. So it's definitely stronger. And the fact that the needles aren't pegged to the top doesn't necessarily mean that this is a worn out CRT. It might have always looked like this on this particular tester. I'm going to hold down this life test button here, and I'm holding it now. And it looks like the needles aren't even moving at all. Very unusual. Maybe they went down just a tiny bit, but that's, uh, well, I guess an indicator that this thing has better life. I'm going to let go. I'm really not noticing any change at all. Now I can hear it now. People are going to be saying, hey, can you rejuvenate the other CRT? I have found that on color CRTs, that is not something that actually works. I've only had luck ever 
doing the rejuvenation on monochrome CRTs. So I'm not gonna try it here because it's not gonna result in a better picture, not to mention I have to connect this thing back up to the set to even test it, and I don't intend to do that. Now what I do like to do is I'm just gonna write the test values, uh, we, what we got, 0 0.7. Uh, that way, if I ever go to test this thing in the future, and I'm just gonna put 9, 2023. 20, so if I ever go to test this thing in the future, I'll have a baseline that I can measure against. Now while the CRT was baking, I was taking a look at the two deflection yolks, and they look almost identical. This has a bunch of brown glue on it, but when it comes to like the plastic and the metal here, they're basically almost identical. They're not identical, not identical, but they're almost identical. So that has me thinking that there's a good chance that the deflection yoke that's on this, which is the donor CRT, is gonna work perfectly inside the monitor. So I'm gonna grab the LCR meter and we're gonna check the inductance of the two coils on both of these and we'll see how they read out. Here's my LCR meter. It's the one I use for measuring caps and things like that. It can measure inductance as well. And when you look at these, you just see a whole bunch of wires, but you have to remember that there are actually two separate coils on here. There's one for vertical deflection and one for horizontal deflection. And that's why we have four separate wires on the connector here. On the television CRT, we have two connectors, one for vertical, one for horizontal. It doesn't really matter which is which right now. We'll have to figure that out in a moment. But I can use the fact that the black and the red wire is one coil and that the gray and the green wire is the other one. And I have it clipped onto the red and the black wires and we're getting 2.0 millihenries, MH. I think that's a millihenry. And on the green and the gray, we're getting 34.18 millihenry. So I just wrote those values down. Let's compare to this one. And here are the measurements on the old CRT, 24.1 versus 34.1 for the new one, and 2.4 versus 2.0. I'm not really sure if that's close enough that it's gonna work, but might as well just try it out. And worst case, I have to just fiddle with some geometry settings. I ran these numbers by my friend Sark, and he thinks that this will just be a drop and replacement. So. He said just to try cutting this off, add the connectors on here, and this donor CRT should hopefully just work properly in that set. First things first though, we need to transfer over the degaussing coil and the grounding strap to the new donor CRT. So this is the new CRT. It's a good chance that this ground strap probably would actually work, but I'd rather just swap it over. So there's a spring right here, and that allows you to loosen this up, and you can just get it right off the CRT. Usually hooks on the two Areas just like that, and then the spring is in this little, oh, there's a little hook right here. Oh, there we go, it just fell off anyways. And on the old CRT, it's exactly the same thing. So we just take the strap off, like so. And the degaussing coil is next. I need to have the wire go in that direction where the sticker is here. And this should just slide off, just lift it up, just like that. We put it on that CRT, it kind of clips into place. And now the grounding strap. There we go, the grounding strap has been transferred over, as has the degaussing coil. And all that's left to do is connect up this connector for the deflection yoke. Now, the polarity does matter. If you have the horizontal hooked up with the wires reversed, of course the entire picture is gonna be flipped one direction, and same for the vertical. So I'm just gonna probably start with clip leads in case the deflection yoke needs to be swapped over anyways, or if I have that polarity wrong. You know what, I think I'm gonna go for broke and I am gonna solder these connections together. I'm gonna leave the heat shrink on the wires though, and I won't put that over the uh, joints unless, I, in case I need to move things around. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna match the colors. So the red wire here is over on this side of the CRT with the label, and the other yoke, this exact position, which is on this connector here, this is the blue wire. So I'm gonna connect the blue wire to the red wire, and I'm gonna do the same for all the other ones. All right, there we go, the connector's been attached. Next step, get this thing into the chassis. All right, look at that, the CRT is in. Now, it's just a matter of reconnecting these wires and I also need to fix this broken black wire that I cut through last time. And while I'm here, I'm gonna use a little Windex to clean up this high voltage cable here because it's a little dusty. So let's just get this nice and clean just to help eliminate any potential issues with that arcing or anything like that that might happen. I don't remember this thing having any issues with the old CRT, but I just wanna make sure that that stays that way. All righty, let's reconnect the high voltage. There we go. The degaussing coil here, that plugs into the board right there. And the last thing you cannot forget to reconnect is the ground strap. That always goes to the neck board. And that goes right there, there's a peg. All right, the broken wire has now been fixed. I should probably try to, I don't know, tie these wires up a little bit. It's a little bit of a mess here. And then for the deflection yoke, I went ahead and put some tape 
on the open wires, the bare wires. I just don't want that to short out. And the deflection yoke plugs into the board right there. I think we're ready for testing. The yoke's connected, high voltage is connected. The wire's been repaired. This is the video input right there. I think we're really good to go. If things go terribly wrong because this yoke is super incompatible, we'll have a terrible whine out of the CRT or the geometry will be a bit of a mess. Now, one of the things I was noticing looking at this board actually, and I was looking at the various adjustments that are down here, there is no adjustment for the horizontal size. Sometimes there's a width coil, but there isn't one on here. So talking to Sark again, he thinks that maybe I might have to switch this capacitor out here for a different value to change the width, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's just see if this thing even works and it may not, and I might have to switch the yoke over anyways. Okay, it's the moment of truth. I have the test pattern generator here. We'll just turn that on. Why don't we just do a uh, cross hatch, which is already on. Let's see what happens. Okay, took a second to start, but it did. I don't hear a horrible whine or anything. All right, the controls are probably minimal. Yeah, I have everything turned all the way down. Wow, yeah, this is a huge improvement over the other one. Wow, okay. So right off the bat, the geometry looks pretty good. If anything, the vertical size is a little stretched, which is fine, actually. It looks like the deflection yoke actually shrunk the image a little bit, which is good. I actually want to have it uh, more information visible. And I'm on the vertical size control here. So there we go. Oh, it was really stretched out quite a bit. Turn that down a little bit. We want to get these little squares to be, well, squares, right? Now, if I turn the vertical size down too low, we get a little bit of this weird stuff happening at the top here, but luckily it's very minimal right there at the top. So I'm just gonna stretch this up so we don't see that. And there's also a vertical position control here and we can just make it where that stuff goes off the top of the screen. That's looking pretty good. Those are looking like pretty good squares. Let's get some colors on here. Turn the color up here. Whoa, yeah, this is uh, far superior to how it looked before. Far, far better. And one thing I can say for sure is this is a very bright, very sharp CRT compared to the old one. Amazing. What a huge, huge improvement. Full screen color bars look really good. We can also do a full field. So that looks good. We have no geometry issues whatsoever, which, you know, it's completely expected because I didn't touch the convergence assembly or the yoke or any of that stuff. And we can set here what we wanna look at. So there's blue, there's green, looking freaking great. We have a dot pattern that looks pretty good. I mean, there's a little bit of a convergence issue in the corners, but you know, this is a CRT from a TV set. So I can't expect perfection. And if I push this button here, it turns off the chroma. So now we're just looking at a monochrome signal going into the video input. And what I really like about this particular board that's in here is when it doesn't detect color, it actually disables the notch filtering and it gives you a very, very sharp image. That means if you plug in something like an Apple II, when you're in 80 columns mode with text only, the chroma signal is disabled and you should have much sharper text. Now the dot pitch of this particular CRT, of course, is like television standard. So think Commodore 1702 monitor, that's the equivalent. But this monitor, unlike the 1702, supports PAL and NTSC, which right there is a huge, huge improvement over well, all the other monitors I have. And this grayscale ramp here looks really, really good. I think at this point, all I have to do is to tidy up the wires and put that heat shrink on the yoke wires, which incidentally, I got the polarity correct because this would have been flipped that way or this way if one of them were wrong. But my color code, just looking at the two yokes, that did the trick. And then let's try this out with a few other input sources and just make sure that this thing looks top notch. All right, the monitor is fully back together and I have the Tektronix TSG-130A on here and yeah. This is a good pattern generator. It generates a much more NTSC compliant signal than that other one. And it looks freaking fantastic. Everything looks perfect. The Simpty color bars look perfect. Convergence on here also looks perfect as well. All these test patterns just look freaking amazing. This monitor is performing wonderfully. Here's a DVD player hooked up via S-Video. And yeah, it looks freaking great as well. There's a little bit of washout on the CRT because I have the bright studio lights on, but if I turn that off, it looks amazing. All right, I have the studio lights off and yeah, it looks so good. And I know people like to guess what I'm playing here. Anyone recognize this? You probably do. I'm just gonna hit stop here. I don't wanna do any kind of copyright violations, but yeah, guess the, uh, the content 
I found this VHS tape on the street here. It says the debate about men and women. <laughs> Let's see what's on here. I'm putting this in my super VHS VCR. So it's connected via S video here. If we get some naughty content, then I will be jumping to something else. Color bars that I did not record on there. Boy, the color certainly doesn't look very good compared to the test pattern generator and that's VHS. VHS color is just, yeah, pretty junk. One thing I'm noticing though, is I am seeing that little mark on the bottom that moves around that's for VHS tape. So I probably need to expand the vertical size just a little bit to hide that. Now I do not have the sound hooked up just because who knows there's copyrighted stuff on here. But what is this? <laughs> it looks like relatively low budget production on this tape. And judging by the way these kids are dressed, I'm gonna say this is definitely from, <laughs> it's from the 90s. Oh yeah. The ultra close-ups on the camera work here, <laughs> it's a little old school. <laughs> That's funny. I'm not really here to critique the content. I really wanted to just see how this monitor performed hooked up to a VHS VCR. And what can I say? It looks freaking awesome. It really does. And then I had to hook up a Commodore 64. Let's see how this looks. And this is hooked up through S-Video. Uh, is my machine working? Mm, I don't see anything missing from inside the computer. Does this computer finally break? Oh, no, there we go. And I know you're seeing some flicker on your screen and that's because this is in PAL mode. Let's switch over to NTSC. So we go into the config utility, hit save, we power cycle the computer. We should be in NTSC. Yes, now we're in NTSC. Now, since I have the 64 on the bench, I have a couple of cartridges to try. I got these from Dave at VCF. So let's put this in, which is obviously the Ghostbusters game for the 64. Ghostbusters! <laughs> <laughs> All right, obviously the sound is connected and it looks great, really. The uh, image looks really good, very pleased with that. <laughs> All right, F1 to continue. I think the only thing that I would need to do, let me turn the volume down here, is as I talked about with the VHS, I just need to expand the image ever so slightly because it just seems like a, well, it's a little bit moved up towards the top and it just should be stretched out a little bit more. Well, there we have it. The Pro Video VM1401C is working freaking wonderfully. Not quite sure if it's as good as it was when it was brand new. I think the CRT we took out of the TV was probably, you know, a little bit worn, but compared to the one that was in here, which is this one right here with all the massive burning on it, well, <laughs> it looks freaking great when it's full screen color, like white or one of the solid colors, you don't see all the splotchiness and of course the burn-in that was on this CRT. And it's nice and bright and really sharp and really clear, good focus. Yeah, just no complaints whatsoever. And the chassis itself, that board, which of course had a lot of hours on it, I didn't touch it at all. And it's still working perfectly as well. All the original caps are still on there that were on there when I first got this thing. So it's pretty cool to know that this trash picked security camera monitor, which is very capable, was combined with this trash picked junky Philips Magnavox thing here. And uh, yeah, now we have one really good working monitor. I'll keep this stuff, the guts from the Philips monitor, because those spare parts could be useful for something else one day down the road. You never know. If you have a box full of junk PCBs, it's actually perfect for harvesting parts of, off of. And I've done that many a times. This CRT, on the other hand, this is going to go for recycling, as is the plastic case from that monitor. I know some people will be disappointed I didn't end up doing the RGB mod for this monitor in this video. That'll have to be for something in the future, and I figured it's probably a good idea to keep the tube swap and the RGB mod separate, because those are two very separate things. Not to mention my videos lately have been super long, and I know some people like that, but I'm trying to keep them a little bit more concise. And I figured if I did the mod, that would just take a whole bunch of extra time. But I wanted to show in this video that tube swaps are possible. And when you do it in a color set like this, you can bring new life into an old set. One that deserves to be saved. One that was originally left for dead. This one here well, and the other one. And we took two monitors that were wow, both kind of crap. And then we made one here that is super capable and looks freaking amazing again. Now, one tip I have is when you run your CRTs, keep the contrast turned down into a reasonable level. Don't make it eye searingly bright. That'll help protect the life of the CRT so it can live for years and years and years. Unlike in the 80s, when we were using these things as our only monitor, the number of hours these things got on them, well, it was really high. But the fact is, 
this thing, if it doesn't have some kind of failure, like a flyback failure, should last for a really long time if I run it at reasonable settings here and I don't run it, you know, constantly. Well, that's really gonna be it for this video. Thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't like it. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. I'd love to hear comments down below if you've done tube swaps before on a monitor and had good success with it, or maybe you've done a tube swap and you had bad success with it. I'd love to hear both ways. This was absolutely a success, especially for the fact I didn't have to take that deflection yoke off the CRT and swap it to there. I'd like to give a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling beside the screen. If you want to see your name there, you can do so at the link in the description below. They make all of this possible and my patrons get early access to videos and behind the scenes stuff, things like that. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Turn the monitor off. Bye.